hey, what's the point of having a bachelor's and a master's in neuroscience if you're not going to use it as clickbait for your YouTube videos? <laughs> Hi guys, it's K.O. Greywill, aka Kelso, resident world-building gremlin and creator of the sci-fi fantasy webcomic 85 Unseen. And I am so excited because today I'm going to talk about why and how to write fantasy and science fiction stories that matter through the lens of human behavior, which is what my background is in. Also, today I'm going to try to be a little more off 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 script i can't even say the word off script it's just not part of my vocabulary because what i do is just luxury and i can't help it i am an academic that's what you signed up for anyway today's chat i'm gonna do with this very fitting time lapse of me working on an episode of 85 unseen that was kind of pivotal in the story because it circled back to a key part of my lore which is that the stars don't exist in this universe and that's part of what makes this story a science fiction story which i will also circle back to later. But first, what do I mean by stories that matter? I mean, in a way, pretty much every story matters because it mattered enough to at least one person to compel them to create it in the first place, right? And as creators, I think that we spend a lot of time thinking about the technical aspects of art or storytelling. We understand the structure of stories, creating character arcs, determining plot beats, right? All of that. But the real good stuff, you know, like the angst, the melodrama, the suffering that we inflict on our beloved fictional characters in these fantastical, otherworldly settings, how do we leverage those things to create a story that is meaningful and satisfying to people? And how does the fantasy genre elevate the potential to create meaningful stories? Because it does. I'm going to explain all of this using my personal background in human behavior. And to start, we really have to understand why do humans even like art to begin with? Especially when so much of art contains pain, right? Why do we listen to sad music? Why do we enjoy viewing paintings or photographs that depict human suffering? Why do we go to the cinema to watch horror films? So this is a topic that I care a lot about because for both of my degrees in neuroscience, I had a specific focus on a branch of neuroscience called neuroaesthetics, which is concerned with why and how we find things beautiful. And I'm just going to quote um, Professor Ed Connor at Johns Hopkins right now because I think that he put it best when he said, One of the ultimate goals of neuroscience is to understand the mind, understand the material basis of thought, of our sense of self, the basis for our consciousness. Aesthetics is just one of the most interesting and sublime aspects of conscious experience. And if you don't think that sounds cool AF, click off my channel, goodbye. <laughs> I talked in my first video a little bit about how like being a scientist and being a storyteller gives me access to multiple ways of understanding what it means to be human. And experiencing beauty and experiencing pain are both pretty universal aspects of the human experience. And there are also two things that we can study through science and through art. So for my dissertation, I designed a study that explored how the medium that you use to depict pain can actually impact how viewers relate to and understand that pain. So if we're going to craft a story that utilizes pain or any kind of negative emotions, we have to understand empathy. And if you're writing a fantasy story, that doesn't involve any kind of mental or physical pain, you're probably doing something wrong. So fiction is, in many ways, uh, a reflection of reality. I think that we all can accept that. But I think there's a misconception that fantasy stories are and have been popular for so long by virtue of being escapism. And escapism is important. We get to watch characters go off on these magical adventures in worlds that we could only dream of. And most people would think that being removed from reality 
the pain and suffering that we might witness in those works of fiction is lessened or like less real. Really, it's kind of the opposite. In a way, fictional contexts help us to empathize with and understand pain more. So, okay, let's start with the idea that people can enjoy art, even if it's disturbing or saddening, because this is really pervasive. And it goes back as far as Aristotle. And he originally questioned this in the context of Greek tragedies, right? He wondered how can a performance that evokes feelings of fear and pity, like the pinnacle of human suffering, why would that compel thousands of people to go sit in an amphitheater and watch that play out? And from that grew his paradigm called the paradox of tragic pleasure. So, he theorized that there was something about this spectacle that was transformative, transforming negative emotions into enjoyment. And over the course of thousands of years, philosophers and scholars have continued to like develop theories around this and describe this phenomenon, which led to concepts that you've probably heard of like catharsis or mimesis, and then eventually like a whole bunch of psychological concepts that I'm not gonna get into because then I will start talking about my dissertation. And you should know to never ask a grad student about their dissertation because they will not shut up. So, okay. This has been explored in all sorts of cognitive research on music and films, dance, whatever, basically any kind of art form. And the idea here is that Art gives us a space to simulate or experience negative emotions, whether that's fear or sadness or pain, we can do it through art without repercussions. So we can access all of these emotional experiences that we would never seek out in the real world, right? We can experience fear in a horror film without actually being in danger or we can be moved by another suffering in a painting without having to be in pain ourselves, or listen to like a sad love song without actually getting dumped by someone. So art gives us access to this whole end of the emotional spectrum that we guard ourselves from in the real world. And it says, hey, it's okay to explore and feel these things. So fictional characters can kind of be a way for us to project ourselves into stories, to feel what they feel to an extent. But I think that balance is so tedious, right? So things need to be real enough for our little monkey brain to go, mmm, calculating, yes, this registers as a thing that I am familiar with and recognize, but not so real that our brains are like, oh, this is unpleasant and I don't want to see that. And Another thing that's kind of interesting in this regard is that people tend to empathize more with depictions of pain if the face of the person isn't depicted, which has to do with emotional projection. So the less that we see about the identity of the person experiencing the pain, the better able we are to imagine ourselves in their place, if that makes sense. Also, while I'm talking about empathy, I want to clarify, this is kind of a nebulous word that means a lot of different things in media. In the scientific community, we talk about different kinds of empathy. So there's empathy where you can understand or you can gauge what someone else is feeling. So even psychopaths, which are considered by a layperson to be like the least empathetic kind of individual can have this kind of empathy we call a cognitive empathy but there's another kind of empathy called affective empathy which is where you actually like feel or share what someone else is feeling so when you're creating a piece of media then you should be paying attention to like if i'm conveying a negative emotion to what extent do i want my audience to understand that like to have a grasp on what's going on versus actually sharing that feeling. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that. You can use lighting and pacing and focus and composition to create mood and tension, 
or disorient your readers or communicate feelings and really draw them out and linger on them. And as great as all of that is, we can never really know another person or another character's reality. So, okay, let's say even if you were here with me and we both stubbed our toes on the same box, I could never truly know how you experienced that pain. And this has to do with the idea of the self and the other. There's always going to be a barrier between what you experience and what I perceive what you've experienced. We're just a bunch of walking meat sacks encasing a blob of electrical fat inside our heads. So, so our understanding of reality is contained within that. We can never really truly know precisely how other people experience the world. But what we can do is use our blobs of electrical fat to click that like and subscribe button. <laughs> okay, anyway. This is the beauty of art and stories, right? It's sort of this tool that helps us to approximate other people's realities. And that's why even if we get deep, deep into a fantasy world, we can still relate to the very human things that characters experience. And this is where people screw up, right? If we treat the fantasy world as something that should remove viewers from reality, we're missing out on its amazing potential to elevate the empathetic responses they're already gonna have in response to the many triumphs and tribulations of our characters. Because we seek out art depicting negative emotions, like we want to look at Picasso's beautiful paintings about war and suffering, we want to listen to love songs that make us feel sad things, we want to go be scared into a heart attack watching a horror film. You get me? It's not like someone strapping us to a chair and making us watch Grave of the Fireflies, which by the way is the absolute saddest Ghibli film. It absolutely wrecked me. But the beautiful Ghibli animation in that film is the one layer that's separating me from actual devastating sadness. And the beauty of it doesn't just make me want to tolerate those negative emotions, it actually makes me want to consume that media. So don't look at your fantasy world as like a barrier, but more as the optimal environment for your audience to experience whatever tragedy or thrill you might pepper in. I guess let your characters' very real, very human struggles complement your world, not stand in contrast to it. Also, Ghibli films are a great example of this done well, right? Like all of the fantastical creatures and the setting in Spirited Away, for example, are part of a very intentional commentary on consumption and consumerism. There is a great video on this actually. I'll put it in a card um, in case you wanna learn more about that. Uh, also, I'm not saying that every aspect of your world needs to be like a thinly veiled critique on something. I just mean that you shouldn't look at your fantasy world as just fantasy. And I said this in my Conlang video, the last one that I did, uh, and I'll say it again here, that every aspect of your world building should strengthen your narrative. So, um, another example. Let's look at Avatar. Y'all gonna learn so fast too that I love Avatar, I'm gonna talk about it so much. Okay, so the magic system, bending, right, isn't just cool, zip-zap, boom, elemental magic. The philosophy around each of the four elements and their strengths and weaknesses ties into the show's recurring theme of balance. So, yeah, you just have to, you have to incorporate these things in a way that are, it's cohesive to your story. There is another really good example. Um, this fantastic Chinese sci-fi writer, Chen Chufan, he writes all this crazy like near future sci-fi stuff, right? Stuff to the tune of 
character discovers they are living in a simulation, right? So like almost Black Mirror, but, but less heavy handed. And his stories have won so many awards because even though he's talking about these really out there sci-fi concepts, he finds a way to make it seem almost mundane, like it's our world. And there's always some way that it reflects something about our reality, like our relationship to the environment or information or to each other. A friend recently sent me actually an article about Chen, which I will link below. So I've just been thinking about his stuff and how that is what good sci-fi should be. No matter how bizarre or improbable the premise is, good fantasy stories shouldn't revolve around the disconnect between our world and the story world. Okay, that kind of brings me to my story. So I talked in the beginning about the premise of it, um, which I'm basically drawing out here. And if you've read my story, you know it takes place in a world without stars. Uh, it, ha it, <laughs> it had stars and they're gone. Um, not that they just never existed. And in this episode that I'm drawing, we get some flashbacks where Divim, my second lead, is talking about how his mother had a vision where she saw the stars. And there's all these very sci-fi like glitch effects that I use to depict that. So when I talk to people about this idea of the stars being missing, they're like, oh yeah, huh, that's a pretty crazy concept. Like how could the stars be missing? You know, it's a very sci-fi thing. Or at least on the surface, I think it seems that way. But if you think about it, really think, is it so outlandish for the stars to be gone? In a way, we're kind of missing them in this reality too. Our ancestors had a more intimate relationship with the stars than we could ever imagine. They were literally guided by them. And then with the advent of technology and eventually pretty extensive light pollution, in a lot of ways the stars are missing for us in a way that's not dissimilar to the world that my characters exist in. And to me, that is, that's what's so compelling about sci-fi and fantasy as genres. They're removed enough from reality to give us a place to experience and feel things that we wouldn't want to feel in real life, but still bear like enough resemblance to our world to make it meaningful. And that's what makes stories and other kinds of art so powerful. So when you're writing your epic fantasy series, don't approach your world purely from the perspective of escapism and trying to draw your readers completely out of our, our, our present reality. There is a place for that. And obviously in today's world, you know, people do want escapism, but what makes it meaningful, what makes it a story that sticks with people is for it to be meaningful and satisfying in a very human way and to do that we have to understand how people empathize with things that are fictional and I, I think kind of my philosophy there is to just let your fantasy world be a reflection of our own world to let the fantastical and whimsical parts of it be echoes of the mundane parts of our world. And I think that's all I've got for you guys today. So folks, if you wanna learn a little bit more about some of the things that I have touched on, I actually created this interactive comic, which is hosted on my website. I will link it in the description. It explains my dissertation research, which is on the visual language of pain. So like anything that I've talked about here is probably cited somewhere in that comic thing. You can also read the full dissertation if you want. It's there. <laughs> I would not recommend that as a starting point. If you are really interested in this kind of stuff though, and you want to get a little bit deeper, I am going to put a card up 
for this excellent video called Fiction, Social Cognition and Empathy, Brain, Books, and Beyond. It's a long video because it was a live streamed panel done by this organization called the Convergence Initiative, which actually interviewed me autumn of last year, and they do a bunch of really cool research and projects related to art and cognition. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's chat and I hope maybe it gave you some inspiration or some, some thinking thoughts about a story that you're working on or a world that you're building. My comic and all of my socials as usual are going to be linked in the description. And a huge thank you to my patrons, Suisas, Tharvex, Morning Do 60, and Soda Khan. Make sure to like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more. Bye guys!